The first thing we're discussing, though, today is we discuss the condition called myalgic encephalomyelitis. I think I've pronounced that right. M-E-C-F-S is chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, we know we've got a few people listening this morning that are uh, sufferers of that um, condition. And uh, go on, what was you about to say? It's myalgic. What did I say? Encephalomyelitis. No, it's not. (laughs) Enkef. We'll we'll get Get them lot to confirm it for (laughs) us. Don't start (laughs) correcting me. (laughs) I I, I, I will will stand corrected if I've got that pronunciation wrong. Um, Some say it's similar to long COVID. Yes, we don't want to get too much into the COVID stuff, but there's a small overlap here, which we'll try and clarify when we talk with uh, uh, um, the necessary bodies this morning. Uh, It's for sure a disabling and complex illness. An estimated 260,000 children, young people and adults in the UK suffer with this multi-system illness. People with MECFS are often not able to use, uh, sorry, to do usual activities. And at times, the MECFS may confine them to bed. People with the illness have overwhelming fatigue that is not improved by rest. So you can go to sleep thinking, okay, I'll wake up in the morning. You know, somebody says, you go and get some rest. It's normally the antidote for any issues, but apparently it doesn't work here. MECFS may get worse after any activity. Mm. Now listen to this bit, whether it's physical or even mental. That's scary. Yeah. Other symptoms can include problems like sleeping, thinking and concentrating, pain and dizziness. People with MECFS may not even look ill. So in a minute, we're going to talk with... Wow. <laughs> exactly. In a minute, we're going to talk with uh, Joel, who is... Uh, Joel Gunner, who is a sufferer of this condition. Um, and we're going to talk to him about his situation. He's just a young man. Um, and we're going to get some clarity on what he has to go through. Before we do that, we're going to listen to Dr. Uh, Harris, Lisa Harris, explain exactly what it is. Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Harris, and I'm here to tell you five things about chronic fatigue syndrome. The first thing to know is that chronic fatigue syndrome is a real illness. It is not all in your head or due to a mental disorder such as depression. However, many patients with this chronic condition may secondarily develop a problem such as anxiety or depression. The next thing to know is that there is no specific test for chronic fatigue syndrome. The symptoms are nonspecific. This is why chronic fatigue syndrome is often misdiagnosed. It mimics so many other common conditions. It may take a long time to arrive at a diagnosis, and other more common conditions will first need to be ruled out. Another thing to know is that chronic fatigue syndrome is much more than just feeling tired. It is a chronic disorder of more than six months of overwhelming fatigue that does not improve with rest. You may also experience brain fog and chronic pain. These symptoms may wax and wane, but overall, patients do not worsen. The fourth thing is that some feel that the cause of chronic fatigue syndrome may be due to an infection. The true etiology has not yet been determined. We do know that it is a disorder of immune dysregulation. While there is no cure as of yet, there are treatments available. And lastly, if you find that you have chronic unrelenting fatigue, persistent muscle or joint pain, difficulty with memory or clarity of thought, and headache, you may have chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, so that's the insert. Dr. Uh, Lisa Harris explaining just the, the detail to the illness. We're going to be joined now on the phone by um, Joel Gunner, who is just 21 years of age and suffered with, with the illness for the last two years. Joel, thanks for joining us on Luton Zebra Radio. Can you hear me? Yes, Barry. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. So it's really good to have you on because I was a bit concerned. I was thinking, well, maybe you'll be a bit tired. You won't be able to cope with the interview. Just on the basis of what I read about the condition, how do you feel this morning? It's the same, same day for me, you know, uh, I'm preparing for what I have to do today. I've planned days ahead. Uh, I know this is going to be about, you know, 15, 20 minutes of social interaction. I know I can handle that today. So we're all good. It's, a, it's another day for me. And so take us through the situation. A couple of years ago, you were diagnosed with this. Just before you were diagnosed, what was the, what were the symptoms and what, what was happening with you? So I felt under the weather for a couple of months. I was a bodybuilder and I was, uh, I was quite, I was very strict with my regime. I thought it was just kind of, you know, the diet making me feel ill. But um, 
over the course of a couple of months, I got a, a diagnosis of glandular fever. And uh, eventually, on the 4th of October, woke up on, yeah, 4th of October, woke up the same as I am now. It really was an overnight thing. There was no kind of any presaging thing going on here. When, when you say how you are now, what are the limitations now? What are the, I know you was a bodybuilder, as you said, but what other things did you do that you cannot do now that you wouldn't risk doing now? So any sort of exercise, um, any kind of serious mental exertion. And also, so it, it's hard to realize that until you have a, an illness like this, socializing can be absolutely draining. So I have to really limit who I speak to, when I speak to them and how long. And that, that's not normal. That, that feels really alien to me. Do you, do you get support, uh, Joel? Yeah, I get a lot of support. I've got a very loving girlfriend. I've got her family and my family. I've got some awesome friends. So I'm, I'm really lucky in that regard. And so uh, for the moment, you, because when I spoke to you the other day, you were walking to the shop. Was that, did, did you get, do, you, do you have a distance that you will not go beyond? Yeah, I have more of a time because I walk at the same pace really every day. So I have a time of about 10 to 15 minutes. If I go 10 minutes one way, I know I'm going to be pushing it if I go any more to get back, if that makes sense. I never leave, you know, too far from the car or home without knowing I can get back safely. What about having a crash? Because that's the term that's used for people that uh, um, ultimately have the most difficult time with this illness. Tell me about, have you had a crash and what, what, what is it? How does it manifest itself with you? Yeah, I think crashes can, can range in severity. So I've had a, a bad crash that lasted for about four months where I was debilitated. I had a game of badminton back in September and I felt that until January. So it's the longest game of badminton I've ever played. Wow. Uh, but really kind of crashes tend to, for me, I, have, I get them every fortnight. And it's a couple of days, maybe two or three days where I'm feeling horrendous. I've, I've got to try and get through the, these things. But I'm very lucky because I, I kind of pick, up, pick myself up quite quickly. I've got friends that crash for weeks, months and never recover from a crash. And it permanently kind of reduces their, their abilities. I spoke with some others that uh, suffer with the condition. Um, and some were saying that people can be uh, bedridden for years. Bedridden, wheelchair bound, yeah, uh, under the care of, uh, you know, of friends and family for good. It, it's hard to fathom how terrible this illness really can be. Um, Joel, can I ask a question, please? Um, of course. What kind of support, like, do you get from the government? Do you get any support, like, so that's, financially yeah, or anything? It's a very grey area. Um, you've got personal independence payment, which is PIP, as a kind of like a disability benefit. But CFS sufferers rarely get awarded that and they only do through perseverance and really kind of harassing the government to try and help them it's um it, it, it's a it, it's tragedy really that we don't get more support because many people can't work they don't have inheritance and things to fall back on so they end up you know living very modestly or on the streets and it, it can be it can really end up in a terrible situation how has this affected your mental health like since your diagnosis Quite severely, I think when you don't have any physical outputs and, you, uh, and you're confined, you, you feel when you're in a box and trapped sometimes, like there's no light at the end of the tunnel that I could be suffering with this illness for the rest of my life. That really is a daunting thought, but you've got to take this illness kind of hour by hour, day by day, and try and stay positive, because what happens if you don't, that's far worse. Just for people listening, if you're just joining us on uh, the Saturday morning show, Luton Lerma Radio, with myself and Amor KMT talking with Joel Gunner about the condition MECFS, which is chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and it, it's an unknown to many uh, illness. And we're just learning a little bit about it this morning with Joel, who is a sufferer himself. Now, Joel, what, what does it mean for you to, um, when you, when you, you're, you're housebound and you have to sleep and you have to how long does this happen because they say six months you need to be going through this for you to even begin to think that you have this condition yeah that's right and as charles shepherd dr charles shepherd will tell you in a minute up to six months is called post viral fatigue syndrome and that is kind of more of a ephemeral condition that tends to pass but when after that kind of lasts for more than six months that's when you enter into cfs territory and you get a diagnosis and you could be ill for 10, 20, 30, if not more years. So it's, very, it's a very scary prognosis. This is classed as a disease, isn't it? Not it, a syndrome. Do you know what? That's a, 
Yeah, it's more of a syndrome because of the lack of understanding of the cause of the pathology, which is the word Dr. Shepard would use. We don't know what causes this condition. It's absolutely amazing. Mm. Um, one more question quickly. You said okay. you were diagnosed in the last two years. Is it the last two years? Yes, it was January of 2020, so not that long ago. Oh, wow. That's, oh, my word. So how, how did that go for you? I mean, the whole lockdown thing and everything. Yeah. Yeah, so I got the diagnosis and then, you know, went into lockdown. By that time, I was learning how to live with this condition. Um, and the diagnosis was no surprise to me, really. I think, actually, it's one of those things where you're relieved, you're grateful mm. to have finally a term, a label that you can distinguish this, your feelings and your suffering to, you know, what you can attribute them to. Uh, Joel, just, in, uh, just finally, I just want to ask you, what, what challenges do you think are ahead with this? And what would you like to, to see change to, to create more awareness? Of course, radio shows like this and television programs and documentaries, but what else? I'd love to see a little bit more legislation from the government helping people with fibro, multiple sclerosis, CFS, all of these autoimmune, severe autoimmune diseases. I'd like to see campaigns like the Millions Missing, the Emmy Action, the people that are campaigning to get people's voices heard, their stories understood. I'd love to see some more light shone on those sort of people. And I, I think understanding is the, is the biggest thing for me. So Brilliant. that people don't tell me to drink more water or take an iron tablet. You know, they, tell, they, they say, I know what you're dealing with, Joe. I've heard about it. And good luck. You know, Godspeed. Brilliant. That's well Amazing. said. And, and look, you know, I'm not going to keep you on the phone too long. I know that in terms of the energy and stuff, you're pretty limited. But it's been an absolute delight to have you on to, to raise some clarity under this and some awareness. We'll be talking with uh, Dr. Shepard after the break. So he will uh, drive some more clarity under this, I'm, I'm guessing, and map out to address some of these, those areas that you just talked about. So thank you very much indeed. Barry, thank you so much for having me from this whole community. I want to say thank you for taking an interest in us. Absolute pleasure. Now, do you just want to say hello to anybody? Yeah, I'd love to say hello to my family, my girlfriend, all the people listening to support me and all those with CFS out there, even if you're not listening. Good luck to you all. Hope you're doing all right. And I wish you the very, very best and good luck Amazing. going forward. So we're talking about um, MECFS, which is a condition um, that many uh, around uh, suffer with and a lot of us don't know anything about it. Um, we heard from Joel Gunner just a moment ago who discussed his journey so far with this illness just diagnosed a couple of years ago when he was 19 he's now 21 his life has changed uh, dramatically he can't exert himself the way he used to and if he does he has a crash which could keep him in bed for for months and sometimes for some people that don't manage it properly even years now i'm just going to play a quick insert we're going to talk with a dr charles shepherd who is the advisor to the mea the me association we're just going to get some words from dr shepherd first on this insert take a listen to this my name is Dr. Charles Shepherd. I'm medical advisor to the ME Association, which is a self-help support charity for people with ME-CFS. ME-CFS, it's an illness which normally starts suddenly, acutely. It often follows an infection, which may be a fairly trivial infection, and it tends to affect people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, although children can be affected, as can more elderly people. I first got involved with ME-CFS after catching it myself. I was working as a hospital doctor at the time when my patients had shingles and I caught a very nasty dose of chicken pox from it and that's what triggered my ME-CFS off in the first place. I think a lot of people don't realise that it's a very debilitating illness to have. It involves a combination of symptoms but in particular muscle symptoms, exercise induced muscle fatigue and quite often pain, brain symptoms, problems with memory, concentration, tension span, problems with balance, not being able to stand up properly, and also just not feeling well, continuing to feel flu-like. You put them all together and it's an illness which is going to affect every aspect of what you try and do. It's an illness which can, in most cases, be diagnosed by your general practitioner, but he can't do it in a simple appointment, so you probably need to ask for a double appointment if you're querying this diagnosis. Your GP really should take a detailed history to make sure he's not missing any other causes of an ME-CFS-like illness because there are a lot of different illnesses that can present with these sort of symptoms. So after taking a detailed history, your GP will also want to do a range of investigations to rule out things like heart, uh, kidney disease, thyroid disease and other illnesses which can cause ME-CFS-like symptoms. If he's not sure, then your GP can refer you to a hospital specialist for a more accurate diagnosis. 
I think there are five key aspects of management of this illness. First of all is getting activity management correct, getting the correct balance between uh, activity and rest. Secondly is the use of drugs which can be helpful for um, treating things like pain and sleep disturbance, although we don't have a drug which is going to cure this disease. Thirdly is sensible use of alternative and complementary therapies. Fourthly is dealing with work and education where that's relevant. And fifthly is dealing with emotional psychological problems if they arise. Unfortunately at the moment we don't have a drug treatment that will cure MECFS or effectively treat it. And this means that the outlook is quite often rather unpredictable. But we do know that people tend to fall into one of three broad groups. First of all are those who make slow but steady improvement. Hi Barry, can I Second speak at the moment? in the middle who tend to follow a rather sort of up and down, rather erratic course, but they eventually stabilise and follow this pattern. But thirdly, there are a small, perhaps 20-25% of people with this illness who fall into a severe category who remain housebound, bedbound, even wheelchair-bound with this illness. The good news for children and adolescents who have this illness is that on the whole, their outlook is far better than adults who have this illness, and a lot of them do return to full normal health. This is an illness that affects all parts of the person's life, not just the medical aspects. It affects their family, their relationships, their finances, what they do in relation to work, school, social activities, etc. Um, and all these things are going to be affected by having MECFS, and they're likely to be affected for some time. So this is something that people have to come to terms with and get whatever help in the various different areas that they feel is going to make them you know, in improve from those points of view. Dr. Charles Shepard talking uh, some time back to the media about some of the uh, situations with uh, um, MECFS. Uh, I could hear Dr. Charles trying to interject there. Dr. Charles, thank you for joining us on Luton Zerma Radio. It's a pleasure to have you on the radio with us here. Um, well, morning, Barry. Can, can I just explain, in case it's, it's relevant, that I, 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 there may have been a technical problem in that I, I didn't actually hear what I'd been saying in the clip down the line to me here in Gloucestershire. <laughs> no, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because it's, right. it's, it's very much what you have been consistently saying because I've been following a little bit of your work. So I understand that you, you feel very much the same way as what you said in the clip. And what you really were talking about are the conditions and some of the limitations that uh, the patients might have. Uh, Dr. Shepard, I wanted to ask you, we spoke earlier with a patient who was talking about how difficult, how challenging this illness is because they don't get funding and they struggle to even have this recognised by doctors. Now, you uh, are the advisor to the ME Association, so you're the right person to talk to about this. Um, what's happening with doctors? How come they don't know? Well, it's, it's, it's a long-standing problem. Uh, if we go back many, many years when I was at medical school, I was told that this illness was all hysterical nonsense. Go, just go away and forget about it. You won't see a case of it. And I, I think like many of my colleagues at the time, I, I was actually seeing people with this illness and not recognising it, not diagnosing it, and, and in some cases just diagnosing it as depression or, or you know, fed up with life or whatever. Um, so th there is a major problem uh, still with actual medical education of, on this illness. So a lot of doctors are still going through medical school. They're not seeing patients with this illness. They're not being taught properly on how to diagnose it, and they're not being taught how to manage it. Um, and that is reflected not only in what happens in primary care, general practice, but also in hospital-based referral services. I don't know whether there's a referral service in Luton. We are in a postcode lottery. It's not unique to ME, but we are in a postcode lottery throughout the UK in that uh, there are, in some cases, very good hospital-based referral services, which are in jargon multidisciplinary, so people go and see a, a, a whole range of different consultants and specialties to help with different as aspects of management, and that's very good. And there are other places where these sort of services just do not exist. And if you're in a position where you have a GP that either, in some cases, doesn't even believe in this illness, doesn't know anything about it, and doesn't have a hospital-based referral service, then, you know, for the patients, that is very, very bad news. And, and, and it's something which is, I, I have to say, 
uh, probably haven't covered this in, in the programme so far, but we have now got a, a new nice guideline on ME. I've been part of the committee that's been preparing this guideline for the past four years, and that is hopefully going to be published. There, there is a delay in publication at the moment, but that will provide official guidance and recommendations to doctors and make it very clear to them that this is a real serious, very debilitating illness. Mm -hmm. And it does need to be diagnosed early. It needs to be diagnosed within the first three months, preferably of the onset of the illness, which normally follows a viral infection. And then it provides guidance on all the different aspects of management, particularly symptom management on, on how these patients should be treated. And I know that you, as you say, with NICE, you had, you had uh, the, the guidelines, which for all doctors, uh, and physicians um, to adhere to. It's not a mandatory what, what they put in these guidelines, is it? But, but they should... No, no, it, it's, it's as, as in the title. The, these are guidelines. Mm. Uh, they're, they're not um, things that are set in stone, so uh, doctors do still, uh, do still have the ability to use what we call our clinical judgment and, if necessary, deviate from what a nice guideline says. But uh, most, most doctors will follow what a nice guideline says, and if they do something for instance, which a nice, a nice guideline says do not do, and the new guideline um, is changed dramatically from what the old guideline was because the, the old recommendation was to um, recommend a, a form of treatment called graded exercise for these patients, which made many of them worse. That has been removed from, from what will be the new guideline. And if doctors recommend a treatment which is not recommended by NICE and a patient suffers harm as a result, and we know that this is the case with graded exercise at the moment, um, then I think that doctor could open themselves up to litigation in, in, in the courts if the patient comes to harm. So th th there are important principles in a NICE guideline which doc most doctors will, will follow. So the, so the, uh, the guidelines in the, the NICE uh, document uh, have suggested that this GET, uh, graded exercise therapy, is not sufficient. For those that have been undertaking that practice, we've heard some people have been wheelchair bound after this. What, what do you say to that? Well, I, I think it's a national scandal, actually. Um, the current guideline, which came into force in 2007, and when it, came into, when it came into force, it was actually opposed by the charities and many of my doctors who, who don't follow this graded exercise um, routine. Um, it has been in force now for almost 15 years, and over that period, of time, a lot of people have actually been harmed by a treatment which has been recommended by NICE. Um, if, if this had actually been a drug treatment and people were being harmed, um, that would be a national scandal that would have gone into the papers and the medical profession would be up in arms and everything else. Mm. But as it is a behavioural treatment, and unfortunately this disease creates a lot of diversity in opinion and some doctors do sadly still believe that it's a psychological disease. Um, there has not been that outcry from the medical profession about graded exercise, but the important thing that's happened with the new guideline is that an independent analysis of all the clinical trials that are being carried out into graded exercise, along with the expert medical evidence that the committee has been given, and the substantial uh, and really quite consistent patient evidence on the harms of graded exercise, um, has resulted in NICE making what is basically a big U-turn on this mm -hmm. and deciding that graded exercise is no longer a treatment for people with ME. Now, you, uh, I'm going to run a scenario by you. I'd like to get your thoughts on it. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a working man. I have uh, con contracted this condition. Um, I then have to rest. Naturally, that is the... Uh, the effect and um, I contact my work to say look I'm unwell naturally they're going to ask me what is the problem um, can I get a doctor certificate uh, and so on now if yep. when I go to the doctor it's not recognized if I'm left in that small isolated position because no question my work is going to contact me again further down the road to say where is this yep. certificate yep. what am I going to do well it <laughs> The scenario that you've just illustrated is, is clearly quite, uh, is, is just unacceptable. Um, but I accept that it does still exist in certain 
parts of the country. Um, I, I mean, let's put it this way. What should be happening is, is if you go to a doctor and you've got a diagnosis of ME and you are unable to work, then the Department of Work and Pensions, and I work with them on, on benefit issues, um, it is quite clear that if you are not able to work due to ME, then you would be able to qualify for what's called employment support allowance, which is the state benefit for people who can't work. You may be able to qualify for something called personal personal independence payment as well. So you should be covered by the state security system, social security system. Um, as far as work is concerned, we know that many people with this illness, as you've just put in that sort of scenario, um, are unable to work and have to rely on state benefits. But there are, as with many other long-term disabling conditions, people who are sufficiently well to be able to do some sort of flexible or part-time working. And ME is actually covered as an illness. Um, it, uh, important point, of just, just to backtrack here, it, it's actually recognized by the World Health Organization as a neurological illness and the Department of Health. So these sort of issues and disputes should not be arising. Um, but it, it is also in relation to work, and uh, this is important, and also in relation to education. It is covered under the 2010 Equality Act as a disablement. So if you have ME and you are employed, you are covered by that very important piece of legislation. And that means that if you are capable of going back to work on some form of limited modified work regime where hours are modified or, or tasks are modified, um, then you can make use of that and negotiate with the employer to have modifications to your employment um, to take account of your illness. And that's not unique to ME. Lots and lots of people with disabilities um, make use of this legislation. Um, to help them uh, either, either return to work or stay in work um, with a disability or an ill health condition. But, uh, you know, just, just to go back to the original scenario that you raised, uh, that sort of situation, as I say, is, is just totally unacceptable. It should not be happening. And in, in my view, if a doctor takes that sort of attitude to someone and is, is not willing to help a patient with ME, um, it, it, it is a form of professional misconduct. Let, let me jump in there and just ask you, what would the doctor put on the, the certificate then? Well, uh, if, if, if you have ME, uh, this, this can go on a, on, a, on a sickness certificate. It's fully recognised by the Department of Work and Pensions to go on a sickness certificate. So there shouldn't be, there really should not be an issue. Good morning, um, Dr. Shepherd. Um, my name's Amor KMT. Um, I've got a few questions that I want to ask as well, actually, if that's okay. Yes. Um, um, sorry, uh, you are coming on my line. You're coming through very faintly, but carry on. Very faint. Can you hear me now? Can you I hear can me now? I can hear you now, yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, so you're a sufferer yourself? Um, yes, I, I got into this illness through personal experience, as I said earlier on in the program. When I was at medical school, I was told to go away and forget about this illness. It was all hysterical nonsense, which is what I did. And then um, quite a few years later, when I was working in hospital medicine, um, I, you know, like many people with this illness, I, I was a very fit young adult, uh, never had any health problems at all. I unfortunately picked up a dose, a very nasty dose of chickenpox from one of my patients who actually had shingles and went down with ME as a result. And it, it's obviously taught me an awful lot of things um, about this illness, suffering from it from a personal experience. So, Dr. Um, Shepherd, who, who diagnosed you and how long did you have it? Like, before you, you like, before you were actually diagnosed? And um, um, to go well, off of Barry's uh, uh, question... Uh, before you're actually diagnosed and you're getting these symptoms, this is before diagnosis, what does a doctor or a GP, what do they write for your workplace if you haven't been diagnosed with ME? Right. Sorry, let me, let me just go back to the first part. In, in, in my own case, and, and this is very typical of, of you know, people with this illness, um, most people will predate the onset of their ME symptoms to this acute viral infection, which is normally the trigger for it. I mean, there's some very interesting parallels here with people with, with what's called long COVID at the moment. And so people will say that they, they had a viral infection, 
the, the viral infection itself, in my case, the chicken pox, the spots and everything else that, that was associated with the chicken pox went away, but they just did not recover from that infection. It wasn't as though there was an infection and then a gap and then ME symptoms. The, the ME symptoms sort of link in to the actual viral infection. Okay. And so people uh, have their viral infection. They continue to feel unwell and flu-like. They've got this overwhelming debilitating fatigue, which is made worse by exertion, the brain fog, the problems with balance, the unrefreshing sleep, the problems with temperature control. All these different symptoms that come with ME follow on really very, very quickly from um, from the viral infection. Now, the, there is a problem uh, here because um, th these symptoms then start to emerge within, let's say, two to three weeks of the, of the viral infection. And at that point, you're not, uh, a doctor wouldn't normally want to be making a diagnosis of ME. But for someone who's not recovering from a viral infection, let's say, after three or four weeks and, and can't go back to work because they feel so rough, um, then uh, the sort of label that I would normally be putting on um, people in this sort of situation is, is a, what's called a post-viral fatigue syndrome. And again, that is something that, you know, can go on a sick note perfectly legitimately okay. um, and should entitle someone to, to their sickness benefits and any, any work-related benefits as well. I mean... And what the diagnostic process that we want to introduce and make sure mm -hmm. is, is happening is that where people have had their ME symptoms going on for a period of two or three months following a viral infection, that the diagnosis of ME CFS um, is, is seriously considered. And if these symptoms have, have gone on for three months or more, then you would normally be making a diagnosis of ME CFS at that point. So but most people have this, this, if you like, gap of about three months from onset of symptoms before a diagnosis is made. Do Dr. Shepard, the, the label is not ME. Dr. Shepard, let me jump in there. There are some uh, patients that are listening this morning, I know that. Um, and uh, some of the questions that have come from my phone uh, have been of this nature. Has anybody been diagnosed with ME, CFS, and then made a full re recovery? And we're not talking about curing, because apparently, yeah. as you say, there's yeah, no cure. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the prognosis, the outlook for people with this condition, um, certainly in adults, um, is, is, is not terribly good, I have to be honest, in, in terms of full, complete, sustained recovery. But it does occur. Um, it's difficult to put a percentage on it, but it, it, it's, it's I, I would say that it's less than 10%. Um, so it does occur. Um, I mean, there are notable public figures. Uh, I'm not betraying any confidence here because it's in the public domain. Um, but uh, Yvette Cooper, um, you know, the well-known Labour MP, um, yes. um, had, had this illness many years ago and, and has made a full recovery. So, so it, is, it is possible. Um, the, 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 Appar apparently, yeah. it's, apparently, over a certain age, it's harder. Like if you've had it for five years, then the full recovery is is, is, is less likely. Yes, yes. We, I mean, we we've made various estimates on this for various reports I've been involved with, and DWP and everything else, and people um, who are trying to get ill health, retirement, pensions, and things like that. And the general guideline here is that if you have been ill with this condition for five years or more. Um, and that you have tried all reasonable approaches to management and all other explanations for an ME-CFS-like illness have been excluded, then you would give serious consideration to granting someone um, a, an ill health retirement pension on the grounds of permanent ill health. So in other words, if, if someone's had this, an adult has had this for five years or more and has not made any significant progress, um, I, I think the chances are full complete recovery in that sort of situation uh, are, are, are pretty are pretty small. The, the, the other side to that is that people, and I speak here from personal experience, people can have this illness for quite long periods of time, five years or more, um, but uh, then go on to make a, a degree of reco uh, uh, recovery, is not the word, but, but to make a degree of improvement over a period of time. That, that's not impossible. Can people die from the illness, Dr. Shepard? Um, I, that, that, in a way, that, that's a, a slightly difficult question because the, there are certain reasons why people 
um, do die prematurely from this illness. Sadly, the most common reason, I think, is, 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 is sadly suicide. Um, people, that, uh, particularly those who are very severely affected and have lost contact with the medical profession, they've lost contact with their, maybe their friends, their family, they're in financial difficulty, they have a whole pile of, of stresses um, coming at them. Um, I, I think suicide is, 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 is a sadly a real issue in this illness. I mean, it's probably the commonest cause yeah. of, of early death. But there, there are um, issues relating to this illness, uh, prolonged um, immobility, um, some of the drug treatments that, that may be used, um, which also can affect life expectancy. But as far as the actual underlying disease process as we understand it at the moment, um, I have to say there is there is no firm, robust evidence to say that that reduces people's life expectancy. Well, let me just say, uh, the from what I've seen, um, the way that the life is affected, some people can't even have a shower. They can't prepare a meal. They can't keep a job, go to school, take part in family yeah, or social yeah, life. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I call it severe, severely uh, affected and severely ne neglected mm. because what what many of my medical colleagues, and we are highlighting this fact in the, in the new NICE guideline, what many people do not realize is that around about 25% of people with this illness are severely affected, and that means they are housebound, wheelchair-bound, and a small subgroup within that severely affected are very severely affected. Um, they are constantly in bed, they are almost paralyzed, um, they cannot speak, um, they may have to be tube-fed, um, and, and they require 24-hour care. And, and the, the scandal here is that not only do these people in this severe category have great difficulty in getting social care, um, which is required, but they are also really totally cut off from medical involvement because there are no inpatient beds for these people to be properly assessed, certainly dedicated inpatient beds. They can't get to hospital clinics um, to the outpatient departments and very few of the hospital-based referral services throughout the UK provide what we call a domiciliary service, which is again another recommendation in the new NICE guideline, whereby the specialists within the outpatient clinic at the hospital would actually come into a patient's home. So a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, dietitian, whatever, would would ideally be coming into these patients' homes to help, and that just does not happen at the moment. Dr. Uh, Shepard, just before you go, we'll just wrap up in, in a moment, just in 30 seconds if you can, what, what sort of things, and we've got a lot of people listening this morning, and some of them don't get a chance to, to talk with the doctors enough, some of the doctors don't know about it, as you've already mentioned, um, but you, of course, have been a sufferer yourself, and you're obviously pioneering and leading a lot of these, these changes, or recommendations, if you like. What would you say to those that are living in hope, that are, that are perhaps sitting there thinking i have no hope um how would you help them to to uh, to develop hope going forward well i, uh, I think there is there is real hope uh, say, not only attached to the fact we've got a new nice guideline hopefully about to appear it should have appeared on august the 18th there are delays to it which i'm going to end now um but uh, hopefully when that new guideline comes in uh, it, it 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 is making very specific recommendations, not only for how this illness is managed in general practice in primary care, but also almost forcing hospitals to set up proper multidisciplinary referral services for these patients. Mm. So, as I say, I don't know whether there is one in Luton, but I mean, Luton is sufficiently big enough to um, have a, a, a proper hospital-based referral service, and I hope that's something that will occur as a result of the of the NICE guideline coming along. But the, the other very important issue at the moment is that we've got long COVID. We've got probably hundreds of thousands of people now suffering from this condition of long COVID where um, they're not getting over COVID. And really, this is just another post-viral condition which has got a terrific amount of overlap with MECFS. And there is a terrific amount, along with that, of interest in research into what is causing long COVID, which has a, a, you know, a range of ME-CFS-type symptoms with it, um, and clinics being set up for people with long COVID. And I, I'm, I'm sure, because I'm involved in some of this work that's going on, that what we are going to learn about the causes of long COVID and the ME-type symptoms that occur in long COVID um, are going to help people with ME-CFS. And at the same point, 
at the same time, um, what we know about the management of these key symptoms in ME, particularly energy management, activity management, brain fog, um, all, all these ME type symptoms that are there in long COVID, um, this is going to be helping people with long COVID and it, it, it already is. So uh, there's a lot going on at the moment. There's also a lot going on in research. And I, I, I think the, the future for this illness, probably the first time in, in my, my lifetime of it, um, is, is really looking quite positive. Uh, Dr. Shepard, I think Moore's got one last question for you. Mm. Um, she, she's been burning, burning to answer <laughs> this question yeah. because uh, she mentioned to me. Go ahead. Oh. Um, um, Dr. Shepard, hi. Hi. How do you cope with having this illness as a doctor? I mean, are you still working? Are you, you sound like you're very active. And um, according to the patient that we spoke to, Joel Gunner, he said even like thinking mentally, he has to put time aside to do any kind of activity. So how does that affect you as a doctor? Yeah, well, I, I got it all wrong. Let's go, let's go back to the very beginning, almost 40 years ago when I, I first developed this. It, it took me two years to get a diagnosis and any real sort of help with management. And I got it all wrong. I, I, like many people with this illness, just tried to force myself um, out of it. And I was just going from <clears throat> uh, going back to work, going off sick, going back to work. This, this awful routine that some people still, still do, do go through. And what, what I've come to the conclusion about is that the most important aspect of management of this illness at the moment is just getting your activity and any energy uh, management correct, getting the right balance between rest and activity. And if you can get that right, and that applies to both physical activity and mental activity, um, then you really can make some progress um, in 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 in. I think the word is living with this illness. Um, and, and that's what I've learned to do. I, I, I don't, like most people, I don't get it right all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, over a period of years, I, I have managed to make a, a considerable degree of improvement. It has been slow, it's been erratic, um, but just carefully managing what my, my activity and energy management and, and going through this process of pacing um, is, is the most important thing, I think, that I've learned in, in, in living with this wretched condition. Now, just finally, I'm, I'm a, a black guy, and I was looking at this thinking, I don't know any black people with this condition. I mean, the people that I spoke with were all white people. Um, but I have read, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that uh, black people are susceptible to this, um, and it says that it's the, the, the two, two to three times more likely to suffer from MECFS than white groups. What, what is going on here? Why don't we know right. this? Right. Well, uh, you know, pe people of all ethnicities um, have this condition. Um, it, uh, I mean, one of the interesting things is if, if we take Africa, for instance, or South America, um, we know that these sort of conditions can follow um, uh, uh, tropical infections like Ebola virus in Africa. Um, there are a lot of people out there um, in Africa who've had Ebola um, who now have basically a, a, a prolonged fatigue, fatigue syndrome. In India, there's a, a, a viral infection called Chuk Chukakindia, um, and uh, that produces many MECFS-like symptoms. Zika infection in South America can produce it. So it, 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 it's not confined to, to white Western um, populations. It's all ethnicities. It's all social classes. Um, it, it's, it's all age groups, although, as I say, it does tend to start in 20s, 30s, and 40s. It affects children and adolescents. It's one of the commonest causes of long-term sickness absence from school. But uh, as, as far as um, black and, and ethnic minority um, uh, populations are concerned. Um, it, 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 it's something that does worry me uh, in particular. I, I have, um, you know, I know quite a few people who, who, who are ethnic uh, minorities who have this illness. And one of the things that concerns me is that they uh, seem reluctant to get involved in things like the support groups. We would love to have more um, people involved with the ME Association. Uh, in this respect, and I, I get quite a lot of emails from people in this in this situation, who you know are, are happy to, to to email for help, but not want to 
do so in Perth. Now, I don't really understand why this is, and I think it's something we need to look at. Well, I, I was reading something. It says a group of a group from Institute of Population Health, University of Manchester, has been examining why this might be and what barriers might be in the way. Some of those things have mentioned uh, language barriers uh, in the Caribbean and in certain parts of the world. Um, uh, they're, they're suggesting that uh, uh, people use d- alternative uh, means to, to help these sort of situations because they don't know. You know, like in Jamaica, you might go and drink a bush tea or something. You know, yeah. I, don't, I, you know I don't know what it is, but um, there is not enough awareness. Dr. Uh, Shepard, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Uh, it's been okay, an absolute okay. delight and pleasure. Just, before I go, can I just sure. mention uh, a, a, a sort of follow-up to this? Um, we, we have a... Uh, a, a volunteer hope, um, run um, helpline, which is open, it's open every day of the week, uh, including weekends. It's yes. morning, noon, and evening. Please give that um, up. And that's called ME Connect. And I'll just give you the number for sure. that if, if anyone wants to ring up for any any further information or whatever. Um, and that's zero three four four five seven six five three two six. Um, and we also have a, a very lively Facebook page, and I know our social media person put your um, uh, radio broadcast up on the Facebook page. Um, so if, if anyone's got any queries they want to raise on the Facebook page, they could go there as well. And absolutely. Them in. Yep, a- absolutely. Okay. Dr. Shepard, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure right. having you, and uh, uh, appreciate your time. Have yourself a great day, and uh, look after yourself. Thank you very much, Barry. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 That's uh, Dr. Uh, Charles Shepard, the advisor to the MEA, the ME Association. Lots of detail in there, in what, what he's saying there. The, the big thing that stands out for you, uh, Amor, what, what would you say? <laughs> what, what's what's been out for you? Slightly speechless, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Caught me off guard well, there, Barry. So, there's a lot of good stuff in there, because he's... he's uh, one of the things I get from what Dr. Shepard is saying there is that he's been... Uh, uh, um, a sufferer himself and so 40 years yeah 40 years when he said that i was blown away so it kind of it kind of matters to him to have this at the front of his agenda to make you know you know things matter to people that we're where well, you've been involved in them than, I, than yeah absolutely you. if it affects you of course you've got more drive more gumption for it because I, you know exactly how these people feel i think the uh, a lot of the patients and the people uh, suffering with this um will, will be grateful for somebody like dr shepherd because you know, he is trying to inform the uh, nice, nice rather, um, guidelines to to come into line with what he thinks is best practice for this and uh, helping to get rid of things that are not best practice, like this GET, graded exercise therapy. These are doctors telling people to go and, and you know, do sit-ups, yoga, whatever it is. And these people are ending up in wheelchairs. So thanks to uh, Dr. Shepard, he's working extremely hard to change that. So... Anyway, we are uh, 12 minutes after 11 o'clock on Saturday, the Saturday morning show. Myself, uh, Mary G and Amor KMT. Um, we've spoken this morning about the MECFS. If you have any issues and concerns, um, please do feel free to contact us. Um, the, you, can contact, uh, you can contact directly uh, 0344 That's a number that... Uh, uh, Dr. Shepard gave out me connect and uh, you can contact us 07908974543 which is here in the studio and we can help point you in the right direction if you feel as though this might be something you would need to be feeling extremely tired and extremely unwell for over six months and, and this is a continuous oh, can thing I, can I just I, I think um, what what um, Dr. Shepard said was He's trying to get it down to three months. So it's now recognised as three months, not six months. Right, so again, these are changes that... Yeah, brilliant changes. ...he's trying to, to, to make. Um, what I... And, and I know a lot of the... Uh, as I say, the, the people listening on the Facebook pages will be uh, in, happy with that interview, but also might be saying, well, we can't get help from the Department of Working Pensions. Uh, Dr. Shepard said he works with them to try and have this recognised. It's not as recognised as it should be just at this moment, and some people are still falling through the the gap, you know, and not being able to get the support that they need. So um, we'll be doing some more on this going forward. Uh, hopefully there'll be more awareness on this, and uh, I hope, uh, as I say, if anybody's got any issues, they can contact us here in the studio, and we can do our best to point you in the right direction. Luton Urban Radio. The power.